In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, burning furnace of charity, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Bruce Springsteen, the famous American singer-songwriter's first big hit was Hungry Heart. Most of us would recognize its well-known line, everybody's got a hungry heart. It describes a, a, a restless man's quest for romantic love. But the truth of this line goes even deeper. Romantic love can satiate the hunger of the heart for a time, but as meaningful as it is, and it really can be meaningful, it cannot satisfy the deepest desires of a human being completely. Made in God's image and likeness, our aspirations for love are truly limitless. For deep down, we seek a love which is unconditional and everlasting. God, who is love itself, perfect and eternal, is the only one who can fill our hungry hearts. Saint Augustine, who sought love in all the wrong places when he was a young man, after years of searching for true love, put this situation this way. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We have other loves, of course, such as a spouse, a friend, a pet, a hobby, all loves on different levels of the spectrum of love. But none of these, and in fact, not even all of these taken together, can satisfy the human heart completely. Only God can do that. Because there's a hole in the human heart so large that only God himself can fill it. We can look for substitutes, and while they may satisfy for a time, they cannot substitute for God. Our hungry hearts will only be satisfied with God. The truly amazing thing is that God himself wants us to love him. He desires that we fall in love with him so that he might fill us with his own love. We discover his love for us when we approach the Sacred Heart. For there we find the very definition of love in the pierced side of Christ. Here we find a love which offers all for us. As Pope Emeritus Benedict said, it is from there, the sacred heart, that our definition of love must begin. If we go to the pierced heart of Jesus, we enter into true love, the sacred heart of Jesus. Imagine, God has opened his heart to us, with all that this entails. Many people believe that devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus began in the 17th century, when Jesus revealed the love of his Sacred Heart in a special way to the French visitation nun, Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque. But devotion to the Heart of Jesus goes back far earlier, even before time began, with the eternal Heart of God. Indeed, the Sacred Heart devotion is not so much our devotion to him, but it's really his devotion to us. God loved us first, and our devotion to him is simply a response to his love. Imagine that. God desires us so passionately that he, that he seeks us out, we who are so small, insignificant, and often unfaithful. He still searches us out. Our great joy comes when we finally stop struggling to escape God and allow ourselves to be loved by him. No wonder Catherine Doherty could say that the greatest tragedy of our world is that men do not know, really know, that God loves them. The adventure of the Christian life is that we're meant to be in a love affair with God, and this is a passionate love affair. He offers all that he is for us. Indeed, he cannot do more to prove his love. He's even opened his heart to us. A medieval mystic put it like this. What more could he do that he, than he has not done? He has opened his very heart to us as the most secret chamber wherein to lead our soul, his chosen spouse. Our soul, his chosen spouse. You know, my favorite image of the sacred heart, the one I think that witnesses to the limitless love found in the secret chamber of his heart, which was opened for us on the cross, 
is not found in a light-filled cathedral, a peaceful monastery, an inner city church, or a suburban parish. In fact, it is found in a place of evil, darkness, and horror. While awaiting execution at the Nazi concentration camp of Auschwitz, Lieutenant Stefan Yazinski etched the, this masterpiece into the cold wall of his cell. In the middle, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is carved with special devotion and is the most obvious detail. What is less obvious is that Lieutenant Stefan has carved himself into the work here with arms wrapped tightly around Jesus and his anguished face placed before the Sacred Heart, the heart that suffered, died and rose for him, he found his own center, hope, and purpose. Stripped of all, he found his true self in the passionate heart of Jesus. And so can we. In many ways, the Eucharist flows from the pierced heart of Jesus and is the great sign of his love for us, a love which overcomes all evil and hatred, conquering even sin and death. In the Eucharist, we are united to Jesus. Pope Emeritus Benedict, reflecting on the Last Supper and the transformation that took place there, one that continues to happen every time Mass is celebrated, said, what is happening? How can Jesus distribute his body and blood? By making the bread into his body and the wine into his blood, he anticipates his death. He accepts it in his heart and he transforms it into an action of love. What on the outside is simply brutal violence, the crucifixion, from within becomes an act of total self-giving love. The first fundamental transformation of violence into love, of death into life, brings other changes in its wake. Bread and wine become his body and blood. But it must not stop there. On the contrary, the Pope says, the process of transformation must now gather momentum. The body and blood of Christ are given to us so that we ourselves will be transformed in our turn. We are to become the body of Christ, his own flesh and blood. Wow, what a tremendous mystery. St. John Paul II was right when he said that in the heart of Jesus is the synthesis of all the mysteries of faith. All true love, desires union and intimacy. And this side of heaven, nothing can unite us with God as completely as the Eucharist. We receive Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity into our hearts so that his sacred heart and our hungry hearts are united. The words of a U2 song come to mind here. Two hearts will beat as one. United with him and transformed in him, we are filled with God. Jesus wants us to stay in intimate communion with him. Remember his words at the Last Supper. On that night, Jesus taught his apostles that through receiving the Eucharist, they would truly experience holy communion. Remain in me as I remain in you, he said. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him can do much and bear much fruit because without me, you can do nothing. Through the Eucharist instituted by our Lord at the Last Supper, we are one with him. Lest we are accused of over-sentimentalizing this profound reality, I think we would do well to recall that in order to give us this gift, Jesus would pay a heavy price. He would offer his life on the cross. Since the early church, there has been a strong connection of the Eucharist to the wounds of Jesus, especially his wounded side. We read in the scriptures that just after Jesus' agonizing death, a soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. The blood and water that poured out from his pierced side were seen as symbols of the sacraments, the sacraments of the Eucharist and also baptism. What incredible love. Jesus would hold back nothing of himself for himself. He would die in the human nature he took from Mary that we might 
share divine life with him. The Eucharist puts us in contact with this sacrificial love. As you might know, the word Eucharist comes from a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. In the Eucharist, we enter into the sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross and in thanksgiving for all he has done, offer ourselves to him. If he has lavished his love on me, I want to thank him with a grateful heart by offering all of myself. In offering all, I receive all. As Jesus gives me his body and his blood, his soul and divinity, including his sacred heart, we are drawn into the sacred heart through the Eucharist. St. John Paul II spoke about this reality in the apostolic letter he wrote for the year of the Eucharist in 2005, where he said, the presence of Jesus in the tabernacle must be a kind of magnetic pole attracting an ever greater number of souls enamored of him, ready to wait patiently to hear his voice and as it were, to sense the beating of his heart. In the Blessed Sacrament, we can still meet Jesus today, just as St. John did at the Last Supper, when he laid his head on Jesus' breast to ask our Blessed Lord about the identity of his betrayer. As he did so, he may have even heard Jesus' beating heart, imagine that, learning the secrets of his heart, gaining wisdom and courage. Who knows? Perhaps it was because of this unique encounter with the sacred heart of Jesus that St. John was the only apostle courageous enough to stand under the cross of Jesus Christ the next day. Already at the Last Supper, hearts therefore are being transformed. And at every Eucharist, hearts continue to be transformed, fulfilling the prophecy given by Ezekiel so many centuries ago. I will give them a new heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove their stony hearts from their bodies and replace it with a natural heart. Bishop Tang, the courageous Chinese archbishop who was imprisoned for over 20 years for the crime of being loyal to Christ and his one true church, understood the transforming power of the Eucharist. After five years of solitary confinement in a windowless cell, his jailers came and told him that he could leave it for a few hours to do whatever he wanted. Five years in solitary confinement, and now he could do whatever he wanted? What would it be? Perhaps a chance to call a right family? A hot shower would be really nice? Finally, a long walk outside. Well, what will it be, asked the jailer. I would like, I would like to celebrate mass, replied Archbishop Tang. There is a man who understood the transforming power of the Eucharist. In these pandemic times, it's very difficult for many people to make it to Mass, uh, to make it to adoration. Uh, it's hard to be in the actual presence of Christ now. And many people have to resort to online Masses, uh, online adoration. Through the Sacred Heart, how can those experiences at home where it's a little bit apart from everything, become more, uh, become deeper and better for the people. I think you're right, Deacon Walter. A lot of people are having trouble staying in communion to some degree or feeling united to their local parish community or even to the Eucharist itself because of all the restrictions they're experiencing. One way in which we can deepen that, of course, is to make sure that we watch live stream masses Perhaps we can even watch them on television because there are a number of networks that actually have a daily TV mass. And what I would say is, don't just end it at the 30 minute mark or the 45 minute mark when that mass ends. Instead, try to relish the spiritual communion that you have. It's not the same as receiving Jesus physically into ourselves, but spiritual communion is very powerful because there we really are intimately connected with the sacred heart of Jesus. So I would say not only participate in the daily television mass and Sunday mass from home, but also take time afterwards to really treasure that special relationship that you have with Jesus. And another thing, before the pandemic, I think a lot of us took the Eucharist for granted. One thing that's not happening as much now is that people are doing that. People now realize this incomparable gift that they've been given 
and they really desire it so much. Many people are hurting because they don't receive communion right now. My heart goes out to them. And I would just say to them, look forward to the time of the resurrection, the time of greater joy, which will eventually come. The Eucharist is an invitation to be transformed by love, an invitation for us to turn away from sin and find rest in the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Have you ever noticed when you love someone, they bring out the best in you? In fact, you often want to be better for them because you would be horrified if you did something that would possibly hurt them or have them think less of you. In the same way, love for Jesus necessitates turning from sin toward him, letting go of sin so that we can hang on to him. He seeks to transform us, but we also must participate if we will experience the fullest transformation possible. In fact, St. Paul goes even further by saying that receiving Jesus unworthily is not only lamentable, but can even have serious repercussions for our soul. Therefore, the apostle says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. What a shame. If something like Holy Communion, meant to transform by communion with Christ, was obstructed by our indifference or carelessness. Transformation in Christ. This is what we are offered in the Eucharist. Let us never miss such an opportunity. You may know that before serving the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta, each day, St. Teresa and her sisters would spend an hour in Eucharistic adoration prayer, uniting their hearts to the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Strengthened by this encounter, they then would spend themselves as they served him in the abandoned, the starving, the dying, the abused, finding his image there in the distressing disguise of the poor. Her heart and Christ's heart were in fact united. Hence, her heart was expanded to embrace all. The Eucharist is not an individualistic gift that one receives just for oneself. Instead, in the Eucharist, we receive Jesus' body and are united to him, so that two hearts, his and ours, beat as one. We are meant to live for God and others, just as he did. Any devotion to the Eucharist or the Sacred Heart, which makes it a private devotion between me and Jesus and does not look beyond it to the needs of others is in fact a false devotion. Now, of course, our relationship with Jesus is personal, so it is experienced in a unique way by each individual, but it is always directed at having our hearts transformed so that we can die to sin and selfishness and live for God and neighbor. The more our hearts are transformed, the more they look to the needs of others, away from the ego, isolation, selfishness, to an expansive and sacrificial love, a love like our blessed Lord, entering in communion with his sacred heart, I die to myself and I live for him. The Eucharist is ultimately fruitful if we are transformed in our entirety, being forged in a fire of love into the image of Christ. The intense love of Christ present in the Eucharist is often described in terms of fire, burning, and heat. In the Litany of the Sacred Heart, one of the invocations is burning furnace of charity. St. John Damascene, doctor of the church and patron of theology students, used such fiery language to describe how we are meant to approach the august sacrament and be set afire by it. We approach the Eucharist, he said, with burning desire, so that the fire of our desire, having been enkindled from the coals, burn away our sins and enlighten our hearts. And in the communication of the divine fire, we are equally set on fire and deified. And deified. Father Seamus, because the uh, passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord happened 2,000 years ago, many people uh, have difficulty 
with the concept of the real presence of Christ 2,000 years later in the Eucharist. Um, through the Sacred Heart of Jesus, how can we uh, come to believe more in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? The real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is an incredible mystery. And because we're so locked into our senses, I, I can understand why a lot of people would, would look at these gifts and think this is only ordinary bread and ordinary wine. So how on earth do we know that it's actually Jesus' body and blood? Well, the good news is Jesus said so. That's why. Long story short. Um, Jesus is the truth itself. So truth speaks clearly uh, uh, and truly, or there's nothing true. And he says, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. So how do we know? We can trust Jesus. A great miracle is that God, the eternal Logos, actually became a human being um, as well with the body he took from Mother Mary. That incarnation is an incredible miracle. And that also is a tremendous mystery. If God, who is so unlike us, can be transformed into, into taking our nature and maintaining his divine nature, why can't he do something as simple as entering into bread and wine and transforming them and changing them into his very body, blood, soul, and divinity? There is a precedent. So I think we can rely on Jesus in his actions and his words. In his apostolic exhortation on the Eucharist, Pope Emeritus Benedict said, the substantial conversion of bread and wine into his body and blood introduces within creation the principle of a radical change, a sort of nuclear fission, the Pope said, to use an image that we're familiar with today, which penetrates to the heart of all being, a change meant to set off a process which transforms reality a process leading ultimately to the transfiguration of the entire world to the point where God will be all in all. Can you imagine as powerful as a nuclear weapon is for destruction, the Eucharist is in just the opposite way, infinitely powerful for the transformation of ourselves and indeed the whole world. What can we do to open our hearts to the awesome power of the Eucharist? I'd like to suggest three simple things, which if done frequently enough, will deepen our appreciation for this most august sacrament. Firstly, pray the litany of the sacred heart of Jesus every day. It is a beautiful meditation that will lead you to deepen your appreciation of and wonder at God's unfathomable love for you. While I was a university student, I prayed the litany every night while kneeling beside my bed. And I truly believe it was one of the things that opened my own hard heart to receive and answer the call to the priesthood. Secondly, make your way to Eucharistic adoration frequently. Here, our heart meets his. And like the beloved disciple on the night of the Last Supper, we draw close to his sacred heart, patiently listening. If we encounter him here, we will not only appreciate the gift of his sacred heart, but have the strength to share his love with those we meet, especially the marginalized. And finally, make your way to confession on a regular basis. In order to receive all the wonderful fruits of the Eucharist, we need to be in a state of grace, free from all grave sin. In order to make room in our hearts for Jesus' great love, we have to strip from our lives these lesser loves, expunge them, make room for him, so to speak. Believe me, if you go to confession at least once a month, your spiritual life will be transformed and your heart will be changed. Let me give Chiara Lubick, founder of the Focolare movement, the last word. They are words from the heart. We must enlarge our hearts in imitation of the heart of Jesus. How much hard work this is. However, it is the only thing needed. And when it is done, everything is done. It is a matter of loving each person we meet as God loves him or her. May our own heart-to-heart -heart encounter 
with the sacred heart of Jesus in the Eucharist, enlarge our hearts. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.